Okay, uh, thanks everyone for staying with us up till now. Uh, we have an exciting panel coming up. Uh, so if you just take your seat, we'd like to begin. Uh, the panel is gonna be uh, reviewing the, the status, the future and the evolution of the cloud native infrastructure for telecom. We talk, talk, talked about the uh, cloud native network functions today a lot and how to build them. And I think with the latest presentation we started uh, digging a bit deeper into the infrastructure. Now we're gonna take a head plunge and speak about the infrastructure itself. So we have uh, a team set of uh, panelists today representing uh, huge uh, telecom operators from across the globe. So we'll quickly start with a round of introduction so you know who's who and then we'll dig into the questions. So uh, Yoshi, do you wanna start? Yes. So good afternoon. I'm Yoshihiro Nakajima from NT Docomo. I'm working on the, the NHP platform uh, in, uh, development and uh, the standardization in the, the network visualization, including the, the core and the B, uh, radio side. Uh, so I'm uh, also the uh, chair of uh, HNHP, so thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Philippe Ansargui. I'm VP Software Engineering at Orange. So basically, I'm driving the cloud native uh, telco transformation for, for Orange. And um, if you have some question about the Project Silva that have been quoted uh, early in the over session, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Yeah, and I'm uh, Paul Gunsun from Telenor. Uh, director of the cloud strategy and architecture ac across uh, both the network sites involving uh, centralized uh, public clouds and edge type of workloads and also the IT. Um, more than that, I'm also the vice chair of the open source uh, Mono project uh, hosted by Etsy. Yeah, I think that's enough. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Katsuhiro Horiba from SoftBank. I'm director of the network research office in the uh, research institute of the SoftBank. Um, our team is conducting the cloudification of the mobile core. Uh, we will you know, lift the uh, 5G core on top of the public cloud. And we also trying to figure out the you know, 6G mobile core as a, our research. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks you. So first question is, uh, I would like to get your opinion. What do you see as the current status of uh, telco cloud infrastructure or cloud native infrastructure? And specifically, do you see convergence toward a single architecture or would you say there's still uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, fragmentation with each operator choosing their own architecture? So maybe Katsu, starting with you. Okay, uh, yeah. Unified cost environment is ideal for the telecom operators, but uh, yeah, we have not been there at this time so because uh, there are lots of the requirements uh, for the individual network functions like you know IO intensive or you know, something like a legacy protocol support like SCTP or PFCP. So we need have to adapt multiple CLD at this time, so this is a reality at this time. Yeah, no, I also agree to that, and I think, uh, I think it has been highlighted a lot throughout the presentations in this session as well, both from uh, uh, Ericsson uh, pointing out uh, the view from the network function vendor, and I think Philip from F5 also pointed out some challenges there. So I think uh, I also see that there is still some fragmentation and uh, putting it also from a bit from an operator perspective um, is that um, due to different needs from the network functions as well, uh, we often see that many of the network function vendors kind of insist on bringing their own CAS or uh, Kubernetes uh, platform, uh, which is very tailored to their applications. And why they do that is specifically what you said, like there are specific needs on the networking, uh, looking at the technical side and looking a bit away from uh, the other side, which is more the political side. Um, and that leads to fragmentation because those platforms or those, those cost layers are usually not supporting multi-vendor applications is what we see. Um, so yeah, that's a bit on perspective from my side. Um, I, I would say that um, by design, the ecosystem is fragmented because 
basically we, we, we move from a very vertical integration model to something that is, I would say, much more horizontal. If we just consider what are the different flavors right now, we have, uh, I would say, the, the cast from the network vendor, uh, the, the cast coming from the IT players, we have the hyperscalers, and we have also the, the open source ecosystem. And for instance, the, the, the industrial grade uh, cloud native Telco Silva project is one of these examples. At Orange, um, what basically we are trying to do to push away uh, this complexity is to uh, bet on an industrial model and operating model. Basically, our industrial model uh, really is product that rely on technology. It means that we have two rules of abstraction, but at the end of the day, it's only consistency toward our customer because basically our job is to set up, build and operate the, the core infrastructure that is used by the, the, our affiliates, by, by our country. So we want to keep as much as we can the consistency toward our customer and to manage on our side as much as we can, basically the complexity. But right now, we are really investing about the industrialized, I would say, uh, flavor of the Silva project for the, the CAS side. So I'd like to say that two aspects from the, the, the fragmentation of the, 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 the cloud native. Uh, like uh, uh, from the, the ecosystem side, I think it, it is a good healthy, the diversity of the, 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 the container environment and it's a uh, much, much important. And uh, I think uh, from the standardization point of view, um, fragmentation, it's, uh, it's like a nightmare for everything. Like uh, lots of uh, organization try to realize the, the cloud native things. But um, in terms of the the, the the consumer of uh, uh, specifications or discussion on the, the how to realize the that uh, the teleco cloud native um, it's um, lots of choice and lots of combination that um, it's a very difficult to proceed the huge deployment scenario so <laughs> um, it's a very difficult question for us. Yeah, so it sounds like uh, there are quite a few challenges in getting to a converge architecture, and we'll soon talk about how open source and standards can help. But before that, we said cloud native so many times today, but we didn't really stop for a moment to define it. So I'm curious about what you see as the main concepts in cloud native. Is it just putting everything in Kubernetes? What else is there to become really cloud native? So maybe whoever yeah. wants to take it or by order. So. Okay. Uh, so in terms of the, the cloud native philosophy, so the, yeah, of course the, we are in the telecom uh, network, so we are trying to provide a much larger scale and uh, this fully distributed uh, cloud infrastructure for mobile, uh, mobile network system. And in terms of the, the cloud native, so we need to provide a much higher level SL using the, 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 the flexible and the operation, much efficient, uh, uh, efficient uh, the operations uh, using the container orchestration. In the same time, uh, so we are trying to realize a fully automation uh, regarding the deployment and the operations and the maintenance. So that uh, is uh, much, much important because uh, you know, from the, the 5G uh, era, so we need to provide a lot of uh, uh, the, the network, so customized network to the customers. So that is a diversity for the, the use cases and uh, lots of things. But um, uh, using the, the manual or um, the human operation, it's uh, not enough for the, such, um, the diversity network. So I think uh, the cloud native is a one uh, key success to push towards that uh, future networking. Uh, if, if I may compliment on, um, basically if we only focus on Kubernetes, uh, we won't succeed because uh, if we have uh, a cloud native infrastructure without cloud native services, 
What did we get at the end of the day? So I think that for me, the topic of Cloud Native is much more holistic. So okay, it's about the runtime, but it's all, uh, also uh, on the way we want to design the network uh, function the cloud native way. So the microservices, the, loose, the loosely coupled, to power, um, I would say, the, the residency, the self and auto healing, um, the closed loop reconciliation, the drift management, all the principles that need to be implemented at workload level if we want to have a full stack cloud native. Otherwise, at the end of the day, we will have extraordinary, I would say, cloud native infrastructure with nothing running on it. So I think we must think the topic much more holistically. Yeah, I also agree. I think looking at the runtime and uh, question if it's only Kubernetes, I think we see many examples that are other things coming in as well. Like I was in the Edge session earlier today seeing how like Docker containers are being uh, provisioned and managed with uh, Podman as an example, right? The people are talking about WebAssembly. So there's a lot of things coming in. But I think I also would like to f focus more on uh, the, the bigger aspects of the cloud native because I, I would say Kubernetes is a key enabling technology and definitely needed. But it's, uh, and also Ericsson pointed that pretty well out in their recommendation, focus on the people and the processes. Mm -hmm. Because in my view, Cloud Native is, is, it is really about the people processes and also the tools, of course, and how you kind of move that culture, which is the, the biggest uh, challenge, at least uh, for, I would say, operators with a lot of legacy, but also for other industry with a lot of legacy, and even for the network function vendors. So that is what we really need to move, in my view. And um, ultimate goal of this uh, cloud native perspective that we would like to reduce the operation cost and have a agility for the business. And uh, you know, the Kubernetes provide us the something like uh, um, intent based operation to manipulate the, you know, this kind of the services. But uh, I don't think Kubernetes is the only way to leverage uh, this kind of services, but um, to be honest, the best practice of this kind of services is Kubernetes at this time. Yeah, so we, we heard about um, the goal of adopting cloud native technology and we're in an open source conference, so the obvious question is, what do you think about open source technology and is it applicable to telcos in their transition to cloud native and naturally how do you deal with things like uh, SLA, security, reliability when you're using open source for telcos? So what, what is your experience indicating? Is it applicable? Is it not? What have you learned? I can start. Uh, so I think definitely it's a very, very good question. Um, I'm, I think that there is two things that I want to highlight here. The first one is that um, when we are moving into this horizontal model and basically what we are, I would say, month after month uh, expecting or ob ob observing is that uh, the network function vendors is, are transforming themselves as software vendor. And what happened 20 years back in the IT is quite simple. When we have the disaggregation of the hardware, the orchestration and the software, new roles and new job appears in company. It was the role of doing the integration and who will take the accountability. It will happen exactly on the same way at operating at operator level. And when you are in front of, uh, I would say, this situation, you have different, I would say, flavor to do the implementation. And, uh, and, and open source definitively is one. And from our standpoint, what we are observing is that you cannot only choose open source. You need to be part of the ecosystem. Otherwise, you are absolutely not able to answer to the challenges that you, you, you raised, Rani, about the SLA, about the security, about all of this. So only consuming without be, I would say, deeply uh, in, 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 implied into the, the ecosystem, I think, cannot be successful. And something that is perhaps interesting as well to understand is that, okay, you, you can rely and you can bet on your own, I would say, teams, but there are also very interesting companies that are highly focused into, into, into open source uh, that could really support you uh, in the critical, I would say, uh, SLA or security topic. So it's what we need to understand is that it's, it's it's like, I, I love the answer that I've been given previously by the team of Ericsson. It's not 
good or bad, it's different. And I truly think that it's the case as well for open source. Yeah. Great hearing about open source contributions. as an elephant <laughs> one. <laughs> that yeah. wasn't planned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, to, to comment a bit, no, fully open source, we, we are using it a lot, and I think it's extremely important. On the question, if you just can take it straight down and consume it as is, I would say yes in a way, but there's always a but. There's quite some things that needs to be done, right? Uh, putting in place networking uh, the right way, the service meshes, and especially on security, how you put in place that zero uh, trust, orchestrating the, the, the security policies for the pods, right? Ingress firewalling and all of that. So there, there are quite some things that needs to be done. But in a way, we can take down the, the Kubernetes downstream and, and do that ourselves. But I think a challenge also for the operator is like, uh, like uh, a Telenor operating uh, across many markets in uh, North Europe and also in Asia. You see that uh, in order to get there, we need the capabilities, the people, right? Uh, it becomes kind of some system integration. And that's uh, something which is uh, not that easy to get in place always. That's why we often rely on uh, using vendors uh, to, to get there. I think the open source can provide the you know, individual parts of the system, but we would like to have uh, you know, something like a guru code to integrate them to have a you know, single system. So I think, uh, you know, Lani told that we need to have a you know, um, blueprint and uh, test cases or something like that. We like to share those kind of information. Uh, that is, uh, you know, I think that is a leverage to the open source technologies and open source communities. So in terms of the, the reliability and the, the lots of aspects, SLA, um, I, I believe the, the open source is a one success for the everything. So back to the 10 years ago, so every people said, oh, Teleco said, so we are going to deploy the OpenStack based system or for network system. So now, so many, uh, many operators are running the huge amount of the OpenStack environment. So now, so we are trying to realize the container or cloud native infrastructure for Teleco. So we're using the, yeah, of course, the, the complexity is uh, different and the requirement of the, the net, um, networking is uh, different from the IT and the enterprise uh, use cases. But uh, many trial or many uh, uh, so development, so much development of the cloud infrastructures and uh, application itself is a much, much, uh, um, important uh, to modernize the telecom network system. So, yeah, of course, in the past, the, the each in the protocol between the, the, the network node, it's a dedicated team, even in the, the SS7 or the SCTP, uh, lots of a protocol are developed by in-house, but now, so many, uh, the communication between the, the instances and the network node can be realized using the, the framework. So that is a much efficient development style. So I think uh, such uh, the modernized the development style and the de deployment style will be the much beneficial for the operators. So that's why I believe the open source. Yeah, and that's actually a good segue to my next question because I wanted to ask about, you mentioned protocols and I wanted to ask about standards. So we talked about open source, but what is the role of standards and how can it help operators adopt cloud native uh, infrastructure and CNFs uh, faster? Okay, so, so I would like to say the, the, the such uh, issues from the standardization point of view, because I'm a chair of the HNFB uh, specification. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, the, the, for this specification or standardization work, it's a much, much difficult in the past. Like uh, uh, in the 3GPP, they try to standardize the, the protocol between the nodes. But uh, our uh, the orchestration and the management interface is a very uh, sticky to the, the implementations. 
So, uh, so we cannot uh, survive the uh, without the open source technologies because uh, the the container is a major uh, the, the the Kubernetes is a major uh, orchestration for uh, Kubernetes, as well as uh, the the open stack is uh, one of the, the 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 major the supporting of the PM, and of course um. Like uh, so, we need so the standardization point of view. So the standardization need to work with uh, the open source, like uh, Silvers and the uh, Nephew and uh, the Anuket, a lot of uh, the open source uh, project. Uh, so we try to re uh, reorganize the the discussions or how to promote the implementation for the future uh, the infrastructures based on the open source. Um, I think that uh, when we are talking about standards, um, I'm, I think that the, the topic of open standard <laughs> is, is perhaps uh, something that I, I'm, I, I really love. Um, because I, I would say that it's the way the, the, the CSPs are working together to, to make this happening. Um, just two highlights. I, I don't know if you, if you read um, the, the, the Cloud Native man Manifesto that have been proposed by the NGMN, we released this on September the 13th. So it's a page basically from a CSP standpoint about the, the why our industry need Cloud Native Telco. Uh, a second one that honestly for me is very, very good. It's the one that have been released by the, the, the CNCF CNF um, conformance test on last Friday. Um, a very, very good, I uh, would say, white paper. Uh, that is, I would say, um, giving um, uh, an observation of the pain point that we are now daily life observing and bringing action point. And something that is very interesting about this open standard um, move is that we have a very uh, well understanding from network vendor standpoint. On the discussion that I, I would say on, on, on weekly base having with the, 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 the user suspect we are all working with, honestly, they are quite very positive because at the end of the day, um, it's lower down, I would say, what they are uh, implementing f in a specific mode, and we all know that what is specific is what is killing us, and I would say the, 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 the vendor as well. So, yes, standard, but open standards, it's, it's even more important for me. Yeah, I totally agree with two guys. Yeah, um, I think the you know reference code, working code with the standard is very important. Uh, previously, we got uh, you know OpenStack Taka project. Uh, that is a something like a sample implementation of the NFU O. Uh, I think that kind of the relationship is very important to show and to prove this specification can be used to the real operation. Yeah, no good, good points made. I think like uh, you can see it from, uh, first on the HCNFV, I think HCNFV have always been kind of uh, supportive of open source and also put in place, uh, what should I say, um, uh, modeling um, and uh, the framework for open source to have its life into HCNFV. I think that's a very good thing, but I think on the whole problem, we can look at it from three perspectives. One, you make a standard, and then an open source project implements accordingly, right? Second way is that an open source project goes first, and then you create a standard based on it. Yeah. But I think the third thing is that we need to collaborate. Um, and I think we are doing that to some extent between standards and open source community. But I think that is something we need to increase uh, significantly to to make that, uh, this uh, really fruitful and speed up both on the standardization side, right? And also helping the open source uh, and uh, propelling that. Yeah, uh, I think this is something <clears throat> we're trying to move, do from both sides, both from the open source communities and the standards organizations, sometimes with uh, bigger success, sometimes less, but uh, we're striving to improve there. <clears throat> and I want to kind of switch gears and uh, with my next question, and it wouldn't be a panel without a question about AI, so uh, let's throw that into the game. Uh, with all the things that we've seen and learned uh, in recent years with uh, telco infrastructure and tel NFV and 
the transition um, with hardware and software uh, disaggregation, with standards like Etsy, with open source, where does it put telcos in terms of running AI workloads? Do you think, uh, do you have that, we are ready for that? Are there advantages? What are the challenges um, for running AI workloads on the telco infrastructure? I don't know, maybe Paul, you want to start? Yeah, I can put some, uh, at least some reflections on this, uh, if you say, uh, so we have the GPUs, DPUs and everything, so if we want to put, uh, do the hardware software disaggregation in order to abstract, right, so we need to put some abstraction in place to make that happen. Now I think GPUs and DPUs and uh, other accelerators are really, really, really um, there to be super performant and optimized for what they are there to do. And then when we put an abstraction on top, then there's usually some hurt on or hit on the, the or penalty on the performance. And that is a challenge. We had that for the, in virtualization with the, the NICs, right? We use SRIOV and PCI pass-through. And there's a penalty hit, penalty uh, on the performance that hits. Um, and so how to get around that when doing the, uh, the disaggregation is, is a big question to me. But if we get there, then it, uh, and still maintain the performance. That, that's a huge achievement so that we can get this interoperability also in that space. Uh, so that's just a point on that. Uh, on, on the need for AI, ML, and everything within Telco, definitely there's a lot, and I think we have seen some examples earlier today as well in uh, one of the uh, lightning speeches on, on use cases there. So, I mean, uh, that, that's, uh, that's really uh, coming full speed as we speak. Yeah, um, ultimate goal of our activity, uh, we have a dream to host the, you know, both network functions and uh, something like a, a application for the business, like a edge computing, on top of the single infrastructure. That is a dream. And, uh, but uh, currently, the AI machine learning environment is uh, something like a very tight couple environment between the hardware and the software. And I know that those kind of use cases, very extreme use cases in this era, but we would like to integrate those kind of use cases on top of the single infrastructure. I think this is kind of the physical infrastructure management activity that is the, something like a new activity in Etsy NFE at this time. Um, yes, and uh, those activity can be applied to the you know, acceleration uh, hardware in the virtual radio access network system. So we would like to uh, conduct to abstract those kind of the acceleration card on top of the single infrastructure. Perhaps two, two comments on my side on this. The, the, the first topic is that uh, no AI won't happen if we don't get the data. <laughs> so perhaps that from a standard of specification, uh, if we can get um, a standard way to have exporters <laughs> to have the data in, a, I would say, a, I would say a, a very easy to integrate way, it would be a very good starting point to do the impulse of what Paul uh, introduce um, the second point about um, about AI. Uh, when I reached KubeCon, I was curious about how much Gen AI we will have during the weeks, and I I did I, I did the maths and I I found something like fourteen or fifteen different talks. So I I I, I'm, I would be very curious to, to to know what won't be the, the number on the coming years, but. Uh, what was very interesting is that the first case of Gen AI was about observability and to use natural language basically to to browse uh, our data model to have I would say real time understanding of what's happening. So definitely, um, I would say I'm, I'm quite excited by by observing what what will happen in this area because I think that it's certainly where we need to to have the the best answer on our challenges. I think uh, the, the AI ML is a powerful tool for the operation and uh, the design phases. So, you know, we have a lot, tons of uh, the configuration everywhere. So we need to verify the, the human scale. It's um, not good enough. And uh, we need to uh, automate such a processing as a checking, processing, using the AI ML technologies 
And uh, of course, uh, so we need to run the uh, multi-vendor environment uh, using the, 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 the application level to the infrastructure level. So that means that we need to uh, set up the huge uh, data lake system to proceed the, the, the huge log and the configuration data to the one places. So that is uh, the big challenges for the, the AML, AIML uh, use cases. Yeah, sounds exciting. I do have one or two more questions, but I wanted to give a chance for the audience to maybe um, ask a question or two. So if anybody in the room would like to ask our panelists anything. Uh, yeah. We have a question there. Okay. Um, yeah, so I have kind of like a business related question. So my name is Darryl Grish, I work for 56K Cloud. We're like a small system integrator that kind of helps tel telcos adopt cloud native and software. And one thing I've seen fundamentally really difficult in this industry, and it's also like in the OT industry, is it doesn't pay. So if you look at the GSIs and SIs, and, and their you know, delivery of like say, their, you know, their vendor or partner solutions, and I don't want to be name dropping or anything. So, you know, if you look at like, a lot of the telco industry is dominated in Europe, with two major telcos, the delivery of that is, a, in a large extent, actually where they get the money, where they get the revenue. And now if this is going to be getting restacked on open source, one of the limitations is that suddenly, you know, the telco could do it, or, or a large GSI. So if we want to get, like an adoption going, I think we need to be working with like the people who are doing RFQs, RFPs. So it really gets written in there, in the kind of RFQs, RFPs that people are writing towards that says, we need to see CNF function there. We need to see open source, not just standardization. Because usually, like if you look at GSMA or GGPP, the standard exists and then people develop towards it. Where here we're talking about, let's develop a library and the people gravitate towards that and they get critical mass in the open source industry. Oh, and then by the way, let's make a standard so we you know, can, can have some governance. And in the telco, it's the other way around. So you know, I'd just love to get your opinions on you know, how, how do we address that and, 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 and also how do we address the like, legacy you know, system integrators where licensing and all that complicated delivery and maintaining you know, the telco stack for their operators you know, they're not cannibalizing that, 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 that existing revenue, you know, going open source. Who wants to address that? <laughs> okay, yeah. That's a, a good question. Um, I think, uh, so back to the question on if you are asking for open source, we do, uh, definitely. Uh, into the, like, uh, whether it was OpenStack back in the days or Kubernetes now. That's something uh, we ask for. Um, I know it's not easy, and we have been struggling with this for, or uh, what should I say, eight, uh, how many years it has been since we started uh, moving into Cloud for Network. Um, but I, and I agree, it's a lot about how you put in place, um, what should I say, the service agreements, like uh, and split the responsibility and the operating model around it uh, when it comes to integration. Because uh, if, if you use a system integrator, the system integrator has a big, big role. But uh, the other uh, actors, including the operator, uh, the, what should I say, the cloud platform vendor, and also the application vendors in a multi-vendor setting has uh, specific roles into making it successful. Um, and then we are back also, which was discussed earlier today, a bit on the blame game, who is responsible for what, so it's, it's not easy. I think even if we ask for open source, I think a bit back to uh, yeah, what uh, uh, Philip from F5 discussed in his uh, uh, talk today, is that uh, there are situations where we are maybe lacking something and who is responsible to deliver it. So it is, still, it is still challenging. And that's also a bit back to the first question, I would say, on the fragmentation uh, on, on uh, the cloud platform part, just to put some reflections. But uh, it's, it's a very good question that we are uh, dealing with every day. Hmm. Anyone else wants to answer? Because I, I see we have another question. Hi, everybody. Uh, Rima Yontel, I'm from Red Hat. 
So my question is for all of you. Uh, when you have a CNF vendor who comes to you and you have a platform, Kubernetes platform based on open source, and your vendor tells you, um, I can only run if my application is the only <laughs> one running on your platform, and I need um, root privileges for everything, and uh, I, by the way, I have a service mesh that's gonna be incompatible with the one you're already running, so you need to uninstall it, etc. What do you do? How do you have that conversation with your vendor? What do you tell them? Um, do you accept it? Do you push back? I'm just curious. Thank you. Completely theoretical scenario, right? <laughs> Never happened before. <laughs> Yeah, I think, uh, so in our case, uh, it's a, the, so we need to host the big uh, this, uh, technical debate, how to, how to integrate the application itself on the, 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 the platform. So because, um, you know, the, the vendor expects, so vendor has uh, some prerequisite um, the limitations or uh, conditions for everything. And uh, we need to combine our requirement and uh, their asset to the one places. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, yeah, you are the Red Hat. <laughs> and uh, some, some vendor expect that the infrastructure will be another Red Hat. So that means the, the migration cost is uh, much huge. And uh, so we need to discuss it <laughs> technically. The, the, the theoretical uh, situation you depicted is really real <laughs> i guess um, I, I think that what you what you express is the is the reality of what we are having today um, at range what we are trying to do is to anticipate the topic and to i would say um, proactively uh, reach out to our partners and 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 discuss with them the kind of new requirements we are expecting and we are perfectly aware that it won't happen in a night but if we want proactively start to say we would prefer to work like this, like this, with this kind of requirements, nothing will change. And at the end of the day, if um, I would say we are proactive and if I would say on the, the, the global ecosystem, it's a win-win relation, I think we, we can expect some progress. But unfortunately, the situation you depicted is, 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 is really deadly real. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry, but I think we're I, a bit over time. I overruled and said we could go one last question. Okay. One last question. We've sorry. got plenty of time. Go thank ahead. you. <laughs> okay, here it goes. Uh, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the difference between standards and um, patterns, right? Uh, growing up in, in service provider, everything's a standard, and standards just get more complex. And it gets really complicated when you're doing standards at the leading edge of something because you're often guessing about where things are going to go. Patterns, uh, which is an interesting concept that comes up a lot in Kubernetes and anti-patterns, uh, are more about like general approaches and having things like, like manifestos and things that say these are the set of principles we believe in. I'm wondering what you guys think. Uh, uh, are we capable of somehow rein reinforcing patterns without having everything to become a standard? Uh, that's, a, I guess, a good, <laughs> good question. I think, uh, like, uh, back to the pat patterns and also uh, principles, what, what we do in, uh, for the, the cloud platform, at least, is that we have a set of strategic principles that we follow. And then, uh, in fact, one of them is uh, not standard-based, but it's de facto standard-based. Because we realize that um, if there is a good standard, like uh, say for something which needs specific interfacing to business critical systems that we have, we, we are very strict on following them. But in some other areas, then like specifically when it comes to Kubernetes uh, or the, the cloud layer, it's like um, there are quite some areas where we don't have concrete standards, like um, where we follow the open source. And then that involves, in my view, following the patterns in the open source as well. So it's a good, very good question, and so I'm more into that line. But not for everything, because we don't have open source everywhere, even though I would like to have open source more places. Mm. Uh, if I just can compliment on uh, a very good question. <laughs> uh, I think it depends about uh, the validation playbook that on which we can rely. 
I, I love the, the concept of pattern and anti-patterns, but at the end of the day, against what are we doing the evaluation? So if we have a, an enough consistent, I would say, playbook uh, of, of tests, fine. But we need to, to, to have this, uh, this validation to know that uh, basically the service is delivering what we are expecting uh, express inside the inside the the, 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 the pattern so it's it's for, for me it's it's heavily depends about the way and and the means to to do the testing and the and, and the validation all right thank you very much thank you to our moderator Thanks for thank our, our panelists. panel yes